This is Keegan Michael Key. As long as there's been human communication, there have been stories. And as long as there have been stories, there's been sketch. Three of the foundational tools for building a sketch are the concepts of who, what, and where. You've got who. Jay Quellen, is Jay Quellen here? The what is what's happening in the scene that makes you laugh. You see this suit? Three years old. See the pockets? Brand new. And where? This is Sparta! That's real, they did that every day. <laughs> Ahead of us is a colorful and enlightening journey through the world of sketch comedy. I'm not wearing any pants. Film at 11. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is about this guy, boy. I tell you, when I hear his voice, I smile. When I see his face, I'm elated, man. We can't, he cannot be shortchanged. Emmy, MP, body winning, classically trained actor, writer, and producer. This is a clip from his new podcast, The History of Sketch Comedy, available on Audible. Please give it up for our good friend, the one and only Keegan Michael Key. Aye, aye. Hey. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. hey, Good morning, good morning, good morning. What up, yes. bro? Oh, great, man. How you been? How you been? I've been good. I've been good. I always like to hear a what up, though. That makes me so happy, being from Detroit. That's our thing. <laughs> what, what up, what up, though? though? I love, I love it. I love it. I love it. No, man. I've been good. I've been good. I mean, it's cold. It's cold, but I'm good. You know, it's cold. You got a lot of shrinkage, huh? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More shrinkage than usual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it gets in the negatives, that's when you really got to You got to keep the blood pumping. You know, when it gets up in the negatives, you talking about that zero two zero one uh, windshield situation. You know. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. I I totally get it, man. I love we the have, pod. We have to go into that, though. We don't have to go into that, you know. Well, well you, I, you know, you, you took it further than I wanted to go. That happens, and you I know, did, I did. That. I extrapolated. That was me. That was the that improv, was, improviser in me. I did that. Yeah, you yeah, right. That, yeah, yeah. That, all that. Whose line is it anyway? All that. That sketch comedy, yeah. you know, that just comes out of you. This is an interesting podcast, and was developed and written by you and your wife. How how is that when yes. you guys come together and work? Well, it is, it's actually, it's very magical. I mean, to be, to be honest, this whole thing, uh, the whole podcast is really just a beautiful and touching love letter from my wife to me and, and also to both of our lives, uh, our, our lives, our loves uh, for sketch comedy. And so, you know, my, my wife's name is Elle and she's been my, my business partner for five years. We write together, we, we produce together. And the interesting thing is she's not really, she's not only my biggest fan, she also happens to be a really brilliant writer and director, and she did a phenomenal job of creating this really kind of layered path for me to be able to share sketches and weave in personal stories and along the way educate and inspire people about, about the art, art form of uh, sketch comedy. So we really enjoy working together. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's kind of how we came together. We came together professionally first, and then, and then all the romantic stuff followed. Huh. Hmm. Did anyone yeah. look, you know, it's so crazy that you say that, Keegan, because we have been talking about earlier um, off the story from Pamela Anderson marrying her bodyguard and just wondering, Sway, I pose this question, if it's ethical to marry someone that you hire. Did you guys get any, like, weird looks or things of that nature when you guys started working together but then started doing other things together? No, actually, it, 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 we didn't get that. We didn't get that. I think it was uh, for most of the people that we were associated with in, in our business life. They thought it was a perfect match. They would. They thought it was a perfect match. I think one of our agencies even it was like, "It's about time. It's about time." <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, oh, wow. we, we, and so they felt they felt that it was really natural that we did it. And, and another thing is because we weren't in a um, we weren't in an employer employee dynamic. We were in an equal dynamic. So, and I think most of what it came from was just us noticing it and recognizing each other's skill sets. And uh, we were, when we, when we first started meeting to work on stuff together, it was interesting because one time we were trying to figure out what we could work on, what we could do together. And my wife is like a good, diehard, old fashioned, born in the Bronx, New York Jew. And so she knows every Jewish joke you've ever heard. And we were talking, we were figuring out how to work together. And she was telling me Jewish jokes. I think the first, one of the first jokes she ever told me was she said, there was an old, there's an old lady. And she, she yells down downstairs to her husband. She goes, Morty, why don't you come upstairs and make love to me? And then Morty says, fine, but I can't do both. And I was like, <laughs> I was like <laughs> 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 on the backside and hit me in the back of the head. I cracked up and I'm laughing. 
I was laughing so hard. And she's looking at me and she's like, boy, you really, really find that funny. I'm like, hey, I'm a black boy from Detroit. I don't know these jokes. <laughs> this is all new for me. Right. And, so, and, and so that's how it really started. And we, we started noticing that we shared a sense of humor. And we spent time during that meeting actually also, I love the science of a joke, the setup of a joke what makes it work, when the turn comes, how the punchline is executed, and she does too. And so we kind of found this common ground about what we like comedically. And then it went from there. And then years later, we find ourselves in this pandemic. And she said to me, she said, you know what? You know more about sketch comedy than anybody I know. What if we did a history of sketch comedy thing? And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds good. And we, you know, that's great because we can put it together and then we can, we can do like clips of uh, sketch, famous sketches from the past. And my girl was like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not using any footage for this. You're going to perform all the characters in all the sketches. And I was like, I'm sorry, what, what, what now? What are we doing? <laughs> and, so, and, and that's, <laughs> that's how we, and then, we, and then next thing you know, we've got, we've got this uh, Audible series. Oh, man, this is incredible. And, you know, it's interesting because I'm listening, you know, when I start listening to the first episode, I really like your voice. Yeah. You know. And, oh, and, thanks, boy. Yeah, man, I really, <laughs> you, you have a very engaging voice and you really tell great stories. And I could tell when you would jump into personal stories like driving across country with your family or when you first came to New York. Um, and But the history of sketch comedy is so in- interesting to me. Because when I think of sketch comedy, some of the first shows I grew up watching with my, my grandparents and my great auntie and uncle were the Richard Pryor show. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, Flip Wilson. Flip Richard Wilson. Pryor. Mm-hmm. Uh, Geraldine. Remember Geraldine? Uh, Geraldine, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, baby. Come yep. on, baby. Yeah, Geraldine, yep. Mm-hmm. The, the Carol Burnett show oh, was yeah. amazing, That's- you know. And then if you move up and live in color and, um, th- th- you know, you can key and peel, you know, the Dave Chappelle show and Wild and Out. Wild and Out. Out, yes. Would you- yeah. Facts. Let's talk about Wild and Out and, and, and where does it fit in the scheme of things? So wh- what's so interesting about Wild and Out is that it fits in because it's actually improvisation, which is which. Now, the thing about improvisation, is improvisation is often more often than not is a tool that's used to write sketches. Now, I came up in the second city in Chicago, and that's what we would often use. But there was a big argument in that community. And the, 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 the big contention in that community was always, is improvisation a tool or is it an art form in and of itself? And so Wild and Out decided to move into that second camp. They wanted to make a show where you were coming up with things off the dome right there, and that would be the actual entertainment. And so... Um, what would happen is that falls under the, the, the category of sketch comedy. It's just an, it's an interesting, I, how shall I say it? It's like a hybrid or it's like a, a sub-genre of it. And that's mm-hmm. why there's a whole episode in the, in the Audible series where I, I spend a whole episode talking about the places that you can train to learn how to write sketch comedy and to produce and create sketch comedy. And a lot of it is about improvisation. Um, even like you heard in the intro that you played earlier. And mm-hmm. it was something I originally, when I was talking about the history, I was like, we're just going to do the history of it, just do the history. And it was Elle who said, I think you should, as you, since you're telling personal stories anyway, and you love improv, tell the stories about how you trained, where the training came from, what the systems were like that people learned in. Because you, you have the Second City, you've got the Upright Citizens Brigade there here in New York. Mm-hmm. And it's also interesting, Jordan said years ago, if I may, Jordan said, it's interesting, in the black community, we don't, of, we don't often see African-American improvisers. And the reason we don't, and I thought this was so brilliant of him to say, it, is because they are improvising. They just improvise under the guise of hip-hop. When you're freestyling, you're improvising. When you're freestyling, you're, you're, you're creating something in the moment. You're, it's like you're writing lyrics or a poem or a play in the moment. And I was like, I never thought of it that way. But that's, that's, it's true. It's true. Hmm. What, what, you, what, what I'm thinking as you say this, and, um, and we mentioned Dave Chappelle, and you brought up Jordan, and I was, I was curious. This is kind of a slight pivot because I know David went public when he spoke about not getting paid fairly for the Chappelle show, and it just dawned on me that you guys were there too. Uh, what was your contracts like? Do you feel like you guys were paid fairly, or could you relate to what I, he was I, saying? I, my, feeling, my feeling always was, my feeling always was, uh, in the very beginning, and I don't know if Dave felt this way, because Dave had been doing stand-up prior to that, but Jordan and I had come from the same place. So I felt that the money that we were making was 
um, was commensurate for what we were doing. They were, I felt they were giving us a chance. Right. And, and so, and, and the other thing is what we say, bet on yourself in success. So I thought maybe the thing to do is to bet on ourselves in success that down the road, it may not be in the paycheck for this show, but mm-hmm. this show and this opportunity will manifest more work down the road. And it, and it has. So, so for me, I feel that the, 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 you have to look, you have to look forward toward the future and go, this will help us showcase our talents. And then that money will come later. That's kind of how I always looked at it with Dave. I think it was different because he was such an enormous phenomenon, yeah. right? That, 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 that the money, the money should have been right to what he was creating. And also remember y'all remember back then that was DVD sales when everyone was still watching DVDs. Yeah. yeah. And people were buying DVDs like crazy. You could give Chappelle show DVDs flying off the shelf. He should definitely have gotten a piece of that. You know, that was, I, again, like I say, commensurate to the phenomenon that was Dave Chappelle. Absolutely. Uh, Keegan, Mike, and Key is here to History of Sketch Comedy. It's an audio podcast, and it's incredible, man. It's very interesting. HB, you want to jump um, in? Yeah. Uh, hey, Keegan, what's up? It's Heather. How are you? I, I'm loving How you doing, convers- huh? I'm good. I'm loving the conversation. And I was just wondering, um, as artists, because uh, I consider you an artist. I mean, and, and, and the process mm-hmm. of, of working and writing. My husband always yells at me because I, I have notebooks all over the place. I have them in the bed. I have them in the kitchen. Um, how yeah, is yeah. it for you in your writing process? Do you end up finding, you can hide in notebooks under the mattress or you just kind of put everything in a phone? Like, what is your writing process like if you could share a little bit of it? I put, I put everything in the phone and then what gotcha. I, 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 I okay. use my notes, I use my notes program in the phone. And so that, 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 that phone is there so that you know that if that thing's nagging, it's not that a, an idea is nagging you. It's when the idea hits you and it's, you feel that, you know what I'm talking about? You feel that warm uh-huh. feeling in your body. You're uh-huh. like, oh, and then I got to write it down right now. Got to, especially sometimes it's that 347 a.m. in the morning thing when the idea goes <laughs> yeah. and pops in. And, and because I write with my wife, because we write together, she is a, a, a brilliant writer. So she'll often, sometimes we'll find ourselves up at five in the morning and we'll be writing together. <laughs> She's wow. just writing on the phone. And then the next thing you know, it's like 6.30 in the morning. Like, oh, we got to go back to sleep now. Come on. And so, <laughs> but I, very often that, those, those creative periods are in the morning. But I always use the phone because it's readily oh. available. And also, sometimes I can just talk into the phone. You know what I mean? Like a voice memo. Because I can't okay. type as fast as I'm thinking. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Wow. Okay. You know what I'm curious about, Keen? Like, mm-hmm. I remember when one of your when one of your peers, he had a Netflix special and so many people flooded their Twitter timeline saying that it wasn't funny. And as a comic, a comedian, when obviously you're trying out your jokes on other people, they're laughing, you think it's funny, you have a professional sense of humor. When you see such a big group of people say it's not funny, like, do you look at yourself differently? Do you question the people around you? Like if they are yes people, like how do you kind of understand what went wrong when so many people said, yes, go with that joke? And the audience was like, nah. I think, I think that really what happens is people, uh, you know, th- it is a subjective thing. Comedy is a very subjective thing. So the, 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 uh, one of my executive producers on Key and Peele years ago, he said, look, all you can do is work toward your own sensibility. All you can do is work toward what you like, and then you can't even concern yourself with other people. You, if you are being as intensely and as specifically personal as you can be, then your audience will come. Because they'll smell the authenticity, uh, they'll smell the, 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 the passion, they'll, they'll, they'll have a sense that you are doing something that you actually enjoy that's, that's emanating from inside you. Mm-hmm. And so I, I've, I've, tried to, I've tried to, in a way, kind of have tunnel vision, you know, so that I'm only concerning myself with what I can do. And, and for me, really, it's problem solving. Same thing with Elle. She's, she's, she, because she's a producer and a writer and director – her job, our job in all three of those areas is problem solving. That you're trying to, if there's something that comes up, you go, okay, I'm going to say this line instead of that line because I think it makes more sense. I, I can't. Now, the other thing is, if there's a group of people that don't like it, 
I can't, I also can't analyze where they're coming from in their lives, mm. what it is, what their sensibilities are, what do they think is funny. So that's really what I try to do is in a way consciously make a tunnel for myself and go, I have to be true to myself right here, right down this lane right here. And then you're kind of your own Pied Piper, right? And then everybody else is just going to follow. The ones that like it are going to follow. So then you know, especially if you're being specific, that they're not yes men, that they're mm-hmm. actually, the, and, and the thing is also, I have to say this about my wife, she's, she's, she's got a great sensibility because if it's not funny, she won't laugh. If it's funny, she laughs. Then I go, okay, I know it's funny because she's going to be genuine to me. She's going to be genuine to me. So that's what, that's what helps me, um, that's what helps me navigate, uh, navigate those people. Right. So, you know, the other thing is when you're doing a movie, if you do something and the crew laughs, you're in good shape because the crew's seen a <laughs> bunch of people, right? The crew's watched hundreds of actors. And like, I don't know about this. My man over here doing this. And then if you can get them to laugh, then you know you're in good shape. You know you're in good shape. So then I don't know what to tell you about the people in the audience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Uh- that's great, man. Keegan Michael Key is here. DB, won't you jump in, bro? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny because I actually did have a question about uh, when you're doing a film as opposed to when you're doing sketch comedy live in front of an audience. And um, when you're on set, let's say, for instance, when you did Dolomite, you had Mike Epps, you had Craig Robinson, Eddie Murphy, of course. When you're doing a film, you're not allowed to just be so reactionary to other people's jokes and because you're because you're literally sticking to a script sometimes you're not allowed to Im- improvise at all so in those situations when you're, you're doing a film or a tv show how do you know when to not be the guy who's trying to be the funniest in the scene and and let everybody shine you know what i mean yeah i do know what you mean yeah no that's a really good question what i try to do is I try to listen, I try, I, I try to, um, especially because when you're shooting scenes like that, you're, you're, they go over your shoulder to that one person's face. And then later they go over their shoulder to your face, right? And what I try to do is I try to give the actor as much as I possibly Wow. Did he go away? Yeah, man, maybe that was a part of the sketch. <laughs> 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 I'm going and see. All right, all right. Round of applause. That's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to come back with Celebrity Wire with Tracy G.